Colorado could have proven themselves a Big 12 title contender. And they flopped. You are Locked On College Football, your daily podcast on all things college football. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Was that the greatest day of college football? It might have been. I'm Spencer McLaughlin. This is Locked On College Football, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Insta reactions to a whole host, but not even every game. I don't have time for every game. I do have time for several big ones. This episode brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel. Place your first $5 bet. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. The Big 12 is so much fun. College football is so much fun. Was that the best day in recent memory? Give me a day that was better than that. Go ahead. Do it. Give me a day that had LSU converting a fourth down, winning in overtime. Give me a day that had Oregon and Ohio State with a game of the year billing living up to it. Give me a day that nearly saw Alabama go down for a second straight week as a 20-point favorite. And that's literally not even half of all of the games that are worth mentioning. But uh, we'll get to a lot of them because something's wrong with Alabama. Oklahoma, they're frauds. I knew that they were, and they showed that on Saturday at the Cotton Bowl. But... Colorado had a chance. Colorado had a real chance. So they were down 10 in this game, which wrapped up not long before I'm recording this episode. And all of a sudden, their defense came through. And then Shador Sanders did what Shador Sanders does. And he did his job. 31-28, the final in Boulder, as Kansas State gets the win. Every opportunity was there for Colorado to go win the football game. And I don't put a lot of onus on Shador and the offense for not converting on that final drive because guess what? They'd already scored two touchdowns in less than five minutes to take the lead from Kansas State. And all they needed, all they needed was one singular stop against a team in Kansas State who is a Big 12 title contender and continues to be led by Avery Johnson that hasn't exactly been exceptional throwing the football and in Two blinks of an eye, they were down the field, and then you look up, and what do you know, despite the pass interference, Colorado allows a touchdown anyway. Huge missed opportunity for the Buffs. I mean, they had every chance. They win that game. I said going into it, two things. Number one, Kansas State is a team I view as the more legitimate Big 12 title contender. We saw why. Because their defense came up with a stop when it needed to, and Colorado's could not. That's the difference. It's not that the Buffs were light years away or that they couldn't have won the football game. But if you're going to be at the top of the league, you've got to be able to play more complimentary football. You can't be a two-man team. Ask Arizona how that's going. I'll apologize to BYU in just a moment. But Colorado needed a stop, and they couldn't get it. And a team that is not known for throwing the football went down the field with ease. And then there was no response from the offense. But it turns out you can't ask your offense to score three times in less than seven minutes. That's not reasonable. The Buffs defense, it's improved from a year ago. I think we saw that tonight. I think we've seen that throughout the year. But it's not ready. It's not good enough to play at that championship level. This is a Big 12 championship landscape that has undefeated BYU, undefeated Iowa State, one loss Kansas State, The path to the Big 12 title game for the Buffs went out the window with this game. Massive flop at home. Could have been a thrilling comeback win. I told you going into this game last week on the show, or earlier this week, I guess, because we're still in the same week. You get what I'm trying to say. That I wasn't going to do the switcheroo and say, well, maybe Kansas State isn't that good. No, if Colorado had won that football game, which they had every opportunity to do, I would have viewed them as a Big 12 title contender. But it was this simple. You have to have this game. Kansas State is getting better. I I think they are progressing with their passing game. And they're already an incredibly dynamic rushing attack. They are really, really good. So Colorado had the opportunity of the season to make everyone that has disdain for Colorado hang their heads, sigh, and go, the Buffs are really good. And the Buffs are a good team. They're going bowling this year. I said that before the season. But the Big 12 title contender talk, that can go away now. Because they should have lost to Baylor at home, found a way to win. Full props. Dominate UCF, very impressive. But you got to win those games. You got to be able to get one stop in that moment, and they couldn't. They couldn't. Huge missed opportunity. All right. 
Uh, I've been right on a lot of teams coming into this season, Colorado being one of them. Arizona kind of being another. Oklahoma State being another. That's just in the Big 12. I've also been wrong on a lot of teams. Uh, Allow me to state very clearly for all the BYU fans out there, I have no idea what to make of your football team other than that's a Big 12 title contender. Because that wasn't just beating Arizona, it was dominating Arizona. And you know, early on, when they they had the big win against Kansas State, I said, I don't buy BYU. That was a crazy, fluky game. Yeah, the defense is really good. I don't trust their offense. Well, here's the offense led by Jake Retzlaff, and he's got a story on College Game Day about him for a reason. That guy is playing some really good football. And Kalani Sataki's got the boys 6-0 and in Provo for the first time since 2020. That was a very good season for BYU. And they're on track to have a really good one right now. I, w- I completely whiffed on BYU. I overlooked them coming into the year. I have taken too long to get on the BYU hype train. I asked the question to a different Cougars fan base this time, BYU, that I asked to Washington State once upon a time. Do you want me to start picking BYU to win even if I think they're going to win? Because thus far, I have picked BYU to lose, I think, three times this year. They're undefeated when I pick them to lose. Do you want me to pick them to win? I I have to bow down and say, you know what? I I concede. You have converted me, not to the Mormon faith, which I very much respect, but to the BYU Dr. Pepper hype train. That is where I am because they just look like a more and more complete football team every time they take the field. And I can be stubborn to hold on to my own opinions for as long as I possibly can, but I'm not unreasonable. And BYU is 6 and 0. Oh. They're 6 and 0. Oh. BYU. They were picked to finish near the bottom of the league. They in Arizona State. Now, I saw Arizona State coming, not necessarily to this extent, but picking them last, always thought that was absurd. I didn't think picking BYU towards the bottom was insane. I didn't think you could get through this conference with Jake Retzlaff at quarterback and be a legitimate conference title contender. I'm not going to refute that particular claim anymore. So I apologize, BYU fans. I I owe you, and I hope I, a, a fellow Utah, by the way, beg for your forgiveness because I see the light, shall we say. Iowa State's undefeated. Went in, won the game. Impressive win in Morgantown. Tough loss for the Mountaineers, but West Virginia, one of those teams that I was very right on coming into the season, they're going to finish in the 6-7 to seven win range. That wasn't a very popular take with West Virginia fans coming into the year, but how about Iowa State? Josh Pate is smiling somewhere because there is no bigger supporter of the Cyclones than him, and Rocco Beck and the boys, they are cooking. They haven't just not lost a game in the Big 12 this year. They haven't lost a game, period. And after Washington went into Iowa City today and got run out of the building in the second half, giving up 40 points to the Hawkeyes, how good is that win looking? That was in Iowa City. They they went into Kinnick, walked out with a thrilling win. I don't know who the favorite in this league is right now. I like Iowa State a lot. I've come around on BYU, and I am choo-choo all aboard the hype train. That was a terrible choo-choo. I'm sorry. I don't practice that enough. My voice doesn't go high. I can go low. I can change it in a lot of different ways, but high-pitched things are not the way that I roll. Iowa State's really good. I like Texas Tech as well. I Texas Tech hasn't lost a league game yet. Are we going to talk about Arizona State? Because that win for Texas Tech is further legitimized the more Arizona State plays football. Kenny Dillingham's the right hire in Tempe. I, I'm I'm not certain what their ceiling is this year. They're going to be a bowl team, that's for sure, and that's going to be a great season in and of itself. But Arizona State is no longer a team that you look at on your schedule and say, "Uh, yeah, I think we I think we got them. We we should be fine there." Nope, you best watch out because Cam Scadaboo is going to run through your bleeping chest. That is what's going to happen. This Big Twelve Conference title race was billed by myself and others as the most exciting, the most wide open in the entire country. It's somehow even better. Utah can't throw a forward pass. Too bad. Goodbye. Out of the conference title picture. Insert BYU. Just the way the Cougars drew it up. Something's wrong with Alabama. And I think they can fix it. That is coming up next. 
First, let's talk about our friends at Game Time, which has a new feature. It's called Game Time Picks that makes getting tickets for your favorite live events even easier. Game Time Picks filters out the fluff to show you only incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets. Curation makes it easier to save more on sports, concerts, comedy, theater, whatever you're looking for. Game Time has got it. You get a panoramic view from your seat in the app before you buy. Your purchase is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry which is why you should check out Game Time. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app. Create an account. Use code LOCKEDONCOLLEGE for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account. Redeem code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-C-O-L-L-E-G-E. That's Locked On College for $20 off. Download Game Time today. What time is it? Oh, yeah, that's right. It's game time. Something's wrong with Alabama. They've got problems. There are real problems in Tuscaloosa. And I think Kalen DeBoer can fix it. All in this season? No. But I didn't pick Alabama to win the SEC or the national championship. I think it's pretty clear at this point that's not going to happen. 27-25. The Crimson Tide very nearly go down for the second straight week. That hasn't happened since 2007. It's either 07 or 09. I think it was 07, Saban's first year at the helm. But Kalen DeBoer avoids it, finds a way to win. The biggest problem with Alabama is that Jalen Milrow is trying too hard. He's trying way too hard to make the explosive play, to push it down the field. There's not enough easy stuff in the Alabama offense. And Kalen DeBoer has always had an explosive downfield passing game. I'm not coming on here and advocating to remove that from the Alabama offensive repertoire. But this game flipped. When Alabama blew a coverage on fourth down, that's got to be corrected. Kane Womack did not make the necessary adjustments from last week to this week. That's got to be fixed. And and that, I think, is a bigger problem than Jalen Milrow. But then Jalen Milrow goes out there and throws an inexplicably bad interception at the end of the half, and South Carolina goes down and gets a field goal because of it. And Jalen Milrow also had a safety in this game that gave South Carolina momentum. This was 14-0. Bama was cruising. I thought they were going to dominate this game. And it looked like they were going to. They were at 14-0 with South Carolina staring at a fourth down and eight. And then all of a sudden you look up and Alabama has allowed 19 unanswered points. And you're going, what just happened? What just happened? And there's something missing in that Crimson Tide locker room and on that sideline and in those huddles on game days. Where they get into good positions... And then they they get too excited. They get over their skis. They're gliding down the hill. They're in French fry mode. I I don't ski, but I know French fry and pizza. They're in French fry French fry mode. And then maybe occasionally they should they should shift it to pizza, you know, and just kind of slowly cruise on down. But then they really feel good. And they get riled up. And and then all of a sudden, they lean forward a little and, uh uh-oh, any wakeboarders out there? I, myself, am nothing special. But when you wakeboard or water ski, that's where you get the expression out over your skis. You lean too far forward and you're thinking, I got this. I'm the man. We're, We're cruising. We're good. I could lean anywhere. Oh, dear. That's what Alabama is doing. They are leaning out in front. Stay back. Be content playing a style of football that keeps you winning. They just feel like they forced the issue too many times. So I think that can be corrected. The secondary problems, rut row raggy. They reared their ugly head again, and I don't know how quickly Kane Womack and company can fix that. Injuries or not, they're just having communication problems. I mean, fourth down and eight? And Lenora Zellers has all day to throw. I don't think Alabama's defensive line is the problem. They forced three fumbles in this game. Side note on the Gamecocks, they blew this one. They blew this one. Alabama got a gift. Alabama, Christmas came early to Tuscaloosa because there was a present wrapped under the tree, and they opened and said, three fumbles for me? South Carolina, boy, had a big chance to turn the tide. I think South Carolina is a decent football team. I've seen that throughout the year. Vanderbilt beat Kentucky, by the way. I'm so sorry, Vandy. I don't know what I was thinking, ever doubting you. But Diego Pavia strikes again. 
in Lexington. My goodness, what a victory for Clark Lee and company. Might have to talk about that with its own segment next week, which might be the first ever full segment that Vanderbilt's ever gotten on this show. We'll see. But Alabama on fourth and eight doesn't get pressure, and it's it's like a 40-yard touchdown on fourth and eight. Those issues have persisted. The Jalen Milrow issues, I think Kalen DeBoer can rein him in, but he's too jittery in the pocket. He needs to learn to sit there sometimes. He needs to learn to take a check down or throw the football away or live to fight another play. He's not doing that right now. So there are real problems in Tuscaloosa, but they can, not saying they will, but they can be fixed this year. You know who's fixed their problems from early in the season? LSU. And you can't mention LSU without the week one game to USC. And Lincoln Riley blew that one hard. I'll talk about that more next week. But that was a uh, bad display. I felt so good about my upset pick. And then USC, let's call a spade a spade. They choked. 20-6 to lead at the half, at home, and you lose? Yee. Boy, mismanagement at the end of the game as well. Uh, Not not good times in Los Angeles for Lincoln Riley and company. But um, I don't know how they progress. I know how LSU progresses. Remember when they lost to USC? What was your what, what was your thinking about LSU? Well, I'd... all right. Well, there's Brian Kelly underachieving again. There's this Death Valley at night. Chef's kiss. This was, as I said, the greatest college football day in recent memory. It was hyped up to that and somehow went above and beyond. I, I didn't think that was possible, but here we are. It is past midnight where I live as I am recording this show. I will not be asleep for three hours and I'm waking up in six. That's the kind of day it was. The adrenaline is pumping, coursing throughout my veins. And I'm here for it because this is the greatest sport on planet Earth. And it feels that way to LSU fans once again. Remember, LSU does not have an SEC loss. Remember, LSU hosts Alabama at some point this season. I'm going to get the uh, exact date here because that game is going to loom very, very large. LSU schedule the rest of the year. They can be they convert a big fourth down. Disappointing loss for Ole Miss, by the way. Disappointing. They had it won. They just needed a fourth down stop. Couldn't get it. They couldn't get it. Here's the schedule for LSU. Again, have not lost an SEC game at Arkansas. Tough game. At Texas A&M, tough game. Host Alabama, at Florida, host Vanderbilt, host Oklahoma, who I'm talking about later, and Oklahoma is not a very good football team. How many of those games do you think LSU can win? How many do you think LSU needs to win to get into the college football playoff? That's a separate conversation from how many do they need to win to get in the SEC title game. There is some serious cannibalization going on in the SEC. There is no one team that is head and shoulders above everybody else. That includes Georgia, who played a game against Mississippi State, was not as close as the final score indicated, but we've seen Georgia look vulnerable this year because by the transitive property, they could lose to Vanderbilt on a given day. What can't happen in this league? What can't happen in the SEC right now? LSU, here they come. I'm a big Garrett Nussmeyer fan, have been since I saw him play in that game against USC. And I believe my takeaway at the time was, look, you're going to write off LSU. You're going to write off Garrett Nussmeyer. Don't. Don't, because they've made progress defensively. They hold Ole Miss to 26 points in overtime. And Garrett Nussmeyer, he's that guy. He's just that guy. He's waited around. He's waited his turn. I thought I'd be saying the same thing about Miller Moss in this game uh, or on this day once again. I am not because USC fell. But Garrett Nussmeyer is a guy that is a traditional story in college football that can be fleeting in this, the greatest sport in the world. But LSU, make no mistake about it, tough schedule ahead to be sure. But I don't look at a lot of those games and think, well, they have to play X, Y, and Z. I look at a lot of those games and say X, Y, and Z has to play LSU. Because the Tigers, with that win against a good Ole Miss team, they've turned a corner. And the SEC better watch out because they have not lost a conference game yet. Oklahoma has. Oklahoma's lost two. Oklahoma has lost two. Uh, I tried to tell Sooner fans that they weren't ready for the SEC. They didn't really want to hear that argument. That's okay. Do you believe me now? I hope so. And I love Texas, and I kind of know what to make of Tennessee. Kind of. 
That's coming up next. Coming up right now, FanDuel. Look, this was just an incredible day across the board. Did you want to be in on the action? FanDuel's a place to do it. NFL fans, you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel. That's America's number one sports book, and it's your home for college football. They've got updated odds for the conference championship. They've got updated odds for the national championship, the Heisman, point spreads on individual games. There's so much stuff to just explore. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, and so much more on the same page where you're placing your bets. It's a wonderful service they've got over there. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet, and FanDuel's just a place to go. For anything college football related, if you just want to poke around, there's a bunch of great information. You can learn a lot over on the website, and they organize it with a great interface that's easy to navigate even for a technologically challenged individual such as myself. Check them out at FanDuel.com. So a couple weeks ago, Oklahoma hosted Tennessee. In a game before the year, I thought Oklahoma would win. Then I watched them play a little. I watched Tennessee, and I thought... They're not winning that football game, and they didn't. And Oklahoma fans didn't like that remark, but lo and behold, no one ever likes it when you pick against their team. And after that game, Jackson Arnold uh, was removed as the starter. He was actually removed during the game. And I came on afterwards and said, Jackson Arnold is not the fundamental issue here. He might not be the solution. I think you should play it out because this season isn't going anywhere. And you need to know if Jackson Arnold is that guy, and I don't think you've given him the full college try just yet. And there was, let's see, a lot of flack from Oklahoma fans who do, I mean this sincerely, hold a special place in my heart. I was once a resident of the great state of Oklahoma, got to know many a Sooner and Cowboy fans in my day, and I love them dearly. On this, we have a passionate disagreement because I was informed that Michael Hawkins was the answer. And Hawkins had been outplaying Arnold at practice for a while. And this is the change that needed to be made. Was never my take because I watched the Oklahoma offense and thought, there's no identity. They're getting mauled at the line of scrimmage. This team is not ready. You can't replace an essentially all new offensive line and expect to just go compete in the SEC. And Oklahoma fans didn't care for that particular argument. Well, how are you feeling about it now? Michael Hawkins, 19 of 30 for 148 yards, and Oklahoma runs for 89 yards on 2.3 yards a carry. I said going into this game that Oklahoma has no shot to win. And even after they hung around for mm, a quarter, I never wavered in my confidence in Texas. I believe in Texas. This is not an anti-Texas segment, Oklahoma's week. Oklahoma's a capable football team, but do you know what great ones, they're not that capable on offense, of course, but you know what great teams would do to a team like Oklahoma? This. This is what it would look like. Yikes. Yikes. Sooner fans were quick to run Dylan Gabriel out of town. He won a big game tonight and drove his team down the field for the win, and Oklahoma put up three whole points. And Hawkins didn't even hit 150 yards passing. But that's your answer. That's your solution. Is kick one guy to the curb, put in another young guy with little experience. He's a true freshman, of course. And let's see how he works out. And then in three games, when you realize that Hawkins isn't ready to be a full-time starter in the SEC and win football games, you'll probably go on to the next guy, whoever Oklahoma recruits. So I found that to be ridiculous. And I think I earned the right to take a victory lap there on the Sooners. And in this particular game, I was essentially an honorary member of the Burnt Orange fandom because I gassed up Texas and they lived up to the billing. Quinn Ewers wasn't outstanding in this game. He threw an early interception that didn't end up mattering. And by the end of the game, Texas was having Matthew Golden (laughs) throw passes to the tight end. I mean, Sark was playing with his food. I mean, it was Jerry messing with Tom. And uh, yeah, that's just how much better Texas is here. Texas is a really good team. I loved their offseason. They made really good moves in the transfer portal. They lost a lot. They lost a lot, but they made the right moves in the portal. They've got Quinn Ewers back, and they're just operating at a really high level to the point where they can come out sluggish, and the Oklahoma defense can give them fits for a little while, and then 
it doesn't matter. 34 to 3. 34 to 3. Oklahoma's got to figure out the quarterback situation. When it's been a mess in the last two games, those combined scores 83 to 3 in favor of Texas. The Longhorns are really good. And Oklahoma, they were never the 18th best team in the country. They were never the 15th best team in the country. And that played itself out. And Oklahoma's schedule the rest of the year, it's only going to keep getting tougher. They host South Carolina. That's not an easy game. They go to Ole Miss. Good luck. They host Maine. I think they'll be all right. At Missouri, they could win that game. Host Alabama at LSU. It's going to be a rough first year for Oklahoma in the SEC. A rough first year. Texas, on the other hand, they look like the most complete team in the SEC. I said coming into this game, Texas's defense is the most underrated unit in the country. Three points. Three points. That's exactly what they should have done. The moment I knew in this game that Oklahoma had no chance, which confirmed what I thought coming into the game, was literally the title of my show last week, that Oklahoma has no chance of beating Texas. Lo and behold, they did not. Quinn Ewers throws an interception. Took him a while to get back into the swing of things. And Oklahoma comes away with zero points. Once that happened, I, I, I could have turned the game off. I turned, to, I, I turned to the guy next to me and I said, yeah, Texas is going to be just fine. That game's not going to be close. So Texas rolls. Uh, you know what was close that I didn't think it would be? Tennessee. There's just something about Florida, man. Florida's playing better football. I'll give Billy Napier some credit there. They were up 10 nothing against Tennessee. Remember that high-powered, high-octane Josh Heupel offense? Where did it go? Where, where did it go? I, I feel like I'm Kevin Costner in Field of Dreams trying to trying to visualize the field where is it where, where, where did it go now Tennessee gets gets the win but how are you feeling if you're a Vols fans after this game I I almost put that in a lean lose sort of situation if if you're a Tennessee fan I don't think you should feel great right now you lose to Arkansas on the road and then you come back home with every opportunity to just completely shut down Florida and you you don't you just kind of you just kind of find your way to a 23-17 win I mean Tennessee's five and one it's not like they're out of the SEC title picture they just don't look like the team that they were through the first four weeks of the season they've got Alabama next week that's that's a battle here's the good news for Tennessee legitimate good news I'm not trolling balls fans here Nobody in the SEC is actually that good. So Tennessee hasn't looked great the last couple weeks. Guess what? Neither is Alabama. Georgia's been a little bit shaky. The only team that has been is Texas. They're not on the schedule. They've still got Alabama. They've still got to play. Kentucky could trip you up, but you're at home off a bye. Probably not. You still have to go at Georgia. And yes, you still have to go at Vanderbilt. In no way, shape, or form should Tennessee overlook that football game. Haven't said that in a while, but that's the reality on the ground. With the way the Vols have played in the last three games and, and that Oklahoma outcome, that was a top 15 win at the time, not going to be by the end of the season, and the committee will take that into account whether you think that is just and right or not. I just, I, the, de- the defense is there. Like 17 points to Florida, I, I thought it would be less. I predicted 10, thought it could be single digits. Okay, Florida makes a couple of plays. Like, it's not the end of the world. But where's the offense? Where's it going? Nico in this game, 16 to 26, 169 yards and a pick. Where's the passing attack? I, I'm still looking for it. I know it's in there. It, it is within you, but it has not shown itself on in the field the last couple of weeks. It's going to have to. But Bama, Tennessee... It's going to be really, really fun. And again, good news for the Vols. Good news for the Vols is that nobody in the SEC is that dominant. I don't even think Texas is dominant. They're the best team so far that I have seen. Sure. Dominant? Unbeatable? I don't think so. Appreciate everyone listening. I will see you next time. And until then, hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.